I want to speak to you tonight on going the long way round. Going the long way round. You know, we always look for the, the short way round, don't we? But we're going to be looking for the long way round. The text is in Exodus chapter 13, and we'll read from verse uh, 17 and down to verse number 22. We live in a time when people want things instantly. And oftentimes, instead of taking the time to learn how to do something properly, a person wants to learn what are the shortcuts. And, and it's, it's all well and good to have a shortcut once you know how to do the job properly, but to the danger is in just learning the shortcuts and then not actually knowing uh, how to do that particular job properly. And I guess in all things that we do, we have learnt to, uh, to look for a shortcut and to utilize it where we can. So I think for someone who's training, I always think it's always a, it's far better to go the long way around and take the time to kind of gather all the information that you need and to try and to learn uh, without seeking the shortcut. So when somebody has all the knowledge that they have in that particular field, then you can't look for the shortcuts. But that's a part of my makeup. We're always looking for shortcuts. If you spend any time on a computer, you're always looking for shortcuts. There are certain keys that are give you a shortcut. And I'm amazed that sometimes I, just, I come across them now, I think, wow, I didn't see that before, and I'm so glad to uh, be able to incorporate it. I have a, a particular Bible program that I use, and uh, I was so frustrated because it's different to this kind of computer that I got to what I had before. And I thought, why? Why have they made this program like this? But obviously it is like user, user error. I wasn't getting it right. And um, so as you do, after like using the program for two years, you go to the help section thinking, this, this must be a man thing. So I go to the help section, reading different things. And then I think, oh, this is so easy. I just need to push the command key and I need to push the, the bracket uh, for going this way or going that way to different chapters. It was the simplest thing to go to chapter that, to go to like a, a longer process. I was so pleased for the shortcut. I was really chuffed at myself, but of course, if I had just read the instructions, took the time to do it properly, then I wouldn't have had that frustration. But we're always looking for the shortcut. But you know, the danger is, is that this idea of looking for a shortcut, we've kind of brought that into the spiritual realm where we're thinking in our relationship with God. What is the shortcut? What shortcut can I use so that I can have this growth spurt, spiritually speaking, in my life? What are the shortcuts? Well, we're going to talk about the long way around. So let's pick up reading from verse 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. This particular text that we have before us tonight of the children of Israel it's, it's quite a dramatic text, if you think about all that has happened. The children of Israel had just won a, a, a wonderful victory. You know, when they came up out of the land of Egypt, and they had, been, they had been living as slaves for hundreds of years now, when they came up out of the land, it was as if they had spoiled the, uh, the um, Egyptians. By spoil them, I don't mean by breaking them nice uh, cookies and that type of thing, but by robbing them. By, they, had, they had taken, it was like they were a victory after a battle. They had borrowed of the Egyptians, and the Egyptians just happily gave them of their jewelry and of their gold and of their silver, 
just to get away after all the plagues that they had, and particularly after the plague of the firstborn of every household having died. And so they had won a tremendous victory. They were a people that had been uh, slaves for 400 years, and now they were eventually being set free. And all of this was because of a divine intervention. This wasn't a battle that they had waged. This was all that God had done. God had made the way possible so that they could go free. And it wasn't just a matter of going free. They were promised. Moses and Aaron stood before the people of God and said, listen, God's not just going to deliver you from the Egyptians and from this hard bondage. God is going to bring you up into a land of milk and honey. He's saying, listen, the blessings before you are tremendous. And the, the, all that God has set out in front of you is something that you need to embrace and you need to be encouraged by. And there were, of course, a number of different routes that they could have taken. But we read uh, in our text this evening that although to go through the way of the Philistines would have been a shorter journey, we kind of think it would be about a 10-day journey, although that would have been a, a quicker journey for them to take, we read that God took them a much longer route. And a, it was a route that was via the Red Sea and a route through the wilderness. Now this teaches us a couple of things. The first thing that it teaches us is quite simply this, is that sometimes God's ways are mysterious to us. Don't you find that sometimes you don't quite understand why God is wanting you to do a particular thing? Why He wants you to do it in a particular way? You think, well, this doesn't seem to make, make a great deal of sense. And like I said this morning, we need to be obedient. If we're going to understand the Scriptures, we just need to be obedient, whether it makes it un a sense to us or not. But in, a, in the book of Isaiah, this is what Isaiah says concerning God. And this helps us to kind of put things into perspective when it comes to the mysterious ways of God in his dealings with us. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 and 9. He said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, the children of Israel would not have understood why God was going to be taking them the long way around. In fact, when they came up to the Red Sea initially, they didn't understand why God did that. They had no way of understanding what God would do in separating the waters. But their responsibility wasn't to understand, it was quite simply to obey. Now I could have noticed that if God had chosen the land of the Philistines as a quick route to go through into the promised land, and understand that this was a well-known and well-traveled route, even in more modern times in, uh, with Napoleon, because he had at one time uh, had uh, set the Jews at liberty. He had traveled through this particular route. He would have gone through the way of the, the Philistines. It was a popular route for, for people that were, uh, particularly people that were, were at, at war. It was a shortcut, you could say. But God knew that this wouldn't have been the right route for them. As far as the children of Israel were concerned, if the question was put to them, shall we take the, this quick route, the shortcut? They were full of faith. They could, as far as they were concerned, they could do absolutely anything because they had had this wonderful deliverance. God had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. So they were so full of faith and they would have been, yes, of course, no problem, we'll take this particular route. And, and they had had the promise of Moses and Aaron. We're going into a land that flows with milk and honey. So they would have been quite pumped to take the short route to get into the promised land. But because of God's love for Israel, he knew that the shortcut would have been the worst route that they could have taken. Now we need to understand that in all of God's dealings with Israel, they're always motivated by love. Now, sometimes we don't recognize that in our own lives. You know, we, we sometimes have to take a longer route. Sometimes 
the, our path isn't always easy. And, and we have all sorts of obstacles and difficulties. And, and, and the danger is we can question whether God loves us. Is God operating out of love? God always operates out of love when it comes to us. And sometimes when he chastises or disciplines us, it's always out of love. We just need to rest and resign ourselves to the fact that we serve a faithful creator. And so with the nation of Israel, even though God was saying, I'm going to take you the long way around, God was motivated by love. Understand that God loves Israel. You know, the Bible says of Israel, and this is a tremendous verse in the book of Zechariah, chapter 2 and verse 8. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory that hath he sent me unto the nations, which spoiled you, the notice, for he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. Israel is like the apple in God's eye. You know, there are people today that kind of have two different views concerning Israel. There, there's a group of people that would say that Israel can do no wrong. So there are some churches that would even believe that, believe that because someone is a, a Jewish by origin and of the nation of Israel, that they're automatically going to heaven. And then there are other people that would say that they have an absolute hatred towards the nation of Israel. And, and both of those views are incorrect. The, the fact of the matter is, is that everybody needs Jesus. It doesn't matter if a person is a, is a Jew, they need Jesus. If they die in their sins, where he is, they cannot go. And if a person's a Gentile, like you and I, we need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. And so we don't, we don't look upon the nation of Israel and say, well, because they're the apple of God's eye, that automatically they're going to heaven. They need deliverance. Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel tonight uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But we need to understand that the, the people of Israel need to come to the place where they will accept Christ as their saviour. But on the other hand, there's a group of people that hate Israel tremendously and even don't even recognize uh, that the nation of Israel exists today. And this is in so-called Christian circles. So both of these views are incorrect. I think as a church and as a, as a people of God tonight, we stand with Israel. We want to be a blessing to Israel. We take that promise quite clearly, where God says, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse with you. So we need to take these promises quite uh, quite literally and so we we stand with Israel we want to be a blessing to Israel but in saying that they need to know Christ as Savior but I'm saying this because God loves the nation of Israel we never need to doubt that they're the apple of his eye and in taking them the long way around it is what the nation of Israel needed he knew that they needed much training they needed a lot of instruction before they would be ready to inherit the promised land. You know, if you think that for 400 years, the nation of Israel, where, where the relationship changed, I suppose it was after the death of this Pharaoh that, that didn't know Joseph. Where, where the relationship between Pharaoh and Israel changed, I'm not sure. But you can take that for the, the greater part of that 400 years, they would have lived as slaves. And so they would have been under the uh, influence of an ungodly nation. So for 400 long years, you've got a nation that is getting further and further away from God. And a nation that is certainly not at its spiritual heights. And not only were they spiritually inept to go into the promised land, but they were a people that would have been physically. They weren't ready. They weren't a people that could go up and do war, wage battles against uh, the enemies that would be in the land. The time when the nation of Israel would go into the promised land, there were seven wicked nations that would have to be driving out. These were powerful nations. So they needed a time of preparation. The short 10-day journey, they would not be prepared spiritually, and they would not be prepared as an army to face the nations in that land. So God took them along a longer journey. So God took the long way around. And it was the best way for them. I'd like you to turn, if you would, to Psalms 107. Psalms 107, and we'll read verse 1 to verse 7. <clears throat> verse 1. 
I give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in the solitary way, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And then notice verse 7, and he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. It was the right way. This was the way that they needed to go. They needed to take the long way around get into the land of promise. Now let's understand this, that God always knows our needs and God's timing is always impeccable. And so we just need to resign ourselves to him. As Christians, we can say this. We can quote that verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 where the Bible says, He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We can just recognize that God, having provided for our greatest need, He's surely going to provide for those lesser needs. God knows what He's doing when He takes us the long way around. And we can say this tonight, that God's way of dealing with the nation of Israel is somewhat typical of the way that He deals with you and I tonight. In fact, Paul mentions this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the first 11 verses, if you'd like to turn to that text with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, or as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as, some, as were some of them. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, for some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, unto whom the ends of the world are come. You know, when you read these verses, you recognize that there's a lot of the nation of Israel that is in us. In other words, we, a lot of their characteristics we have. In the same way that they tended to be disobedient, we have that tendency. In the same way that as a nation they were uh, hard-hearted and stiff-necked when it comes to obeying the will of God, that is our tendency. Sometimes the way that we go as believers is a much harder way because God is chastising us, seeking to bring us into a place of obedience. Now you and I, we're on our way not to a, an earthly Canaan, we're on our way to a heavenly Canaan. And indeed, we, when you look at the promises concerning Israel and the promises concerning the church, they are, they are so vastly different. The promises made to Israel always are concerning the earth, inhabiting the land. But the promises made to the church, to you and I, have to do with in inheriting and in dwelling in the heavenlies. And so we're looking forward to a wonderful day that we're going to enter into our promised land when we're going to cross over our Jordan, which would be, the, would be death, and go into the, the land that God has promised us. But as we go along that journey, we find that we are confronted with a whole bunch of things that can be a great source of hindrance to us. And so there's a lot of lessons that we can learn uh, as we go along life's journey. We know for sure that we have somebody that is our, our sworn enemy. Just like the Israelites had their enemies in the land uh, that they would inhabit, 
we have an enemy that withstands us on our way to our land of promise. The Bible says uh, about the devil that uh, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then when we read in, one, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 10 through to verse 11, uh, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We've got, we've got attacks coming around about us all of the time. And sometimes on this long journey that we have to take, God is strengthening us and he's equipping us to deal battle against uh, our wicked and this powerful foe. And then also as we partake in this long journey that we're taking to go to heaven, God knows that there are souls out there that need to be told about this wonderful place that we're going to. And so when, when God saved us, he left us on earth with a purpose. And that is to take the gospel to those that know not Christ. To be a witness. To tell people about the gospel. To point them to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we have a responsibility to show people uh, the way of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, when we get to glory, we'll look back in our life and we can recognize, you know, there's been a long way that we've had to take. Sometimes we've had to bear it with a great deal of patience. But we're able to look back in it one day and we'll say, it was a good way. It was just what we needed as believers. So I want to encourage you tonight because the danger is to think that if I can just have a shortcut in my life, if I can kind of bypass the difficulties, bypass all those hindrances, that's what's going to be the best thing for me. The fact of the matter is, is that God will take you the long route. He'll take you along a longer route so that you can learn lessons and so that you can trust in Him and so that you'll be able to be equipped to do war against that evil one and you'll be a far better and a far stronger and a far more mature believer because of God taking you along that long route. Our troubles really come kind of like with the nation of Israel because God took them a long way around. But then because of their disobedience and because of their unbelief, they didn't believe that God could give them the land. Well, then they traveled in the wilderness for 40 years. They kind of just, the Bible says they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And sometimes we're like that. We kind of fall into a ditch, spiritually speaking. And the long way is, is a lot harder and a lot more difficult because our eyes are off our Savior and we've got our eyes upon the world or the flesh or sin and we fall and we wonder and we drift and then it becomes a lot more of a harder way. But the way that God would have us go would might be a long way but it's always going to be a path that is on the straight and narrow and one that has as our goal and as our objective the Lord Jesus Christ and the one of course that we're to be looking to as believers. So tonight may we be encouraged just to recognize that God will lead us the long way but it's always going to be the right way. And I'd like to end tonight by just quoting the verse of a well-known hymn the hymn says, All the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know, whatever before, Jesus doeth all things well. And so may we just look to the Lord. He may take us a long way, but it's a right way. It's a good way. And may we just commit ourselves unto him, knowing that uh, our God knows just what we need. And so may we commit ourselves to him. May the Lord bless you as you seek and embrace this longer route that God will take you on. Let us pray. Our Father, we are thankful tonight for your wonderful salvation. And we thank you, Lord.